Hello and welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras. And coming up in today's newscast, an explosive revelation. Prime Minister Naftali Bennett responding to reports of recent Mossad investigations into the 1986 disappearance of IDF soldier Ron Arad. Meanwhile, a dangerous synthetic drug resurging on the Israeli streets. Health officials and police issuing a public warning. And finally, is it BDS or just a major shift in the business? International sporting goods giant Nike announcing plans to end its sales in Israel. An intense series of secret operations confirmed this week by Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. The Premier disclosing scant details of a recent Mossad initiative to learn more about soldier uh, Ron Arad. Arad's been considered missing in action since his capture in 1986. <laughs> Responding to Arabic language reports, Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett confirming all but the key details of a dangerous mission to finally close the chapter on IDF soldier Ron Arad. Arad, assumed captured by Lebanese militants in 1986, was never seen again, and he's considered missing in action, though he's also suspected dead since 1988. Still, the whereabouts of his body and the details of both his disappearance and captivity remain unconfirmed. Hence the latest operations to find him. Pidion Shvuim Uerich Yudi Shafach Lehad Mearachea Mekudashim Biotel Shil Medinat Israel Amasher Loicheshe Shed Banav Loyafkir Lezar The Misuga Dvarim Shinirim Meshunim Afilu Mugzamim Lemishemit Bonen al Medinat Israel Mibahuts Aval Zemashe Magdir now, according to reports, the Mossad spy agency conducting two separate missions. In one, the Mossad allegedly taking a DNA sample from a body in Lebanon believed to be Arad's. And in the second operation, Mossad agents reportedly kidnapping an Iranian general, transferring him to an unnamed African country, and interrogating him until his eventual release. Though the original reports neither specifying the identity of the general, nor whether the general is in active duty. In any case, contradicting earlier reports, the Prime Minister's office later claiming that the missions were successful, though again, details are still a tightly kept secret. Born in Hoda Sharon, Israel, Arad became a combat navigator in the Israeli Air Force in 1979. In 1986, on a mission to attack PLO targets in Lebanon, the bomb he and pilot Ishai Aviram dropped apparently exploded prematurely, forcing them to eject. Aviram was discovered by Israeli forces within hours, but Arad was captured by the Lebanese Amal military group, after which he's thought to have changed captors between Iran and Hezbollah forces. Then subsequent negotiations to free him later failing in 1988, around the time he's alleged to have been tortured to death during interrogation. And several operations to locate him or details of his capture ensuing in the coming decades, all to no avail. Arad is survived by widow Tami and daughter Yuval. Now for this next story, forget the coronavirus. Israeli health officials reporting a recent wave of hospitalizations due to the dangerous and illegal synthetic cannabinoid known as Mr. Nice Guy. In fact, at least 39 Israelis have been hospitalized in serious condition this year, including a dozen teens just last weekend. And at least one Israeli was killed by the drug, Rambam Medical Center in Haifa pronouncing him dead on Monday. The Ministry of Health therefore launching a joint investigation with police and issuing a dire warning to would-be users saying that the drug is, quote, particularly dangerous because it's mixed with different substances, including other drugs, poisonous materials like rat poison, pesticides, and more, all of which change from dealer to dealer. A blanket ban on Nice Guy and other synthetic cannabinoids was put into effect in 2011. In any case, joining me now to discuss is director of the Clinical Pharmacology Institute at the Rambam Health Campus in Haifa, Professor Daniel Kernick. Professor, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you very much. All right. Now, you know, what have you noticed about the recent hospitalizations and what are the symptoms and their causes? Um, our outbreak here is similar to outbreaks uh, reported previously in the U.S. Um, the patients um, come with bleeding and um, the bleeding sites can be anywhere. It's often in the urinary tract. So they notice that the urine is uh, blood stained. 
but it can also be in the gastrointestinal tract. They come with blood in the feces, in the stool, or they are coughing up blood. Um, and uh, the worst scenario is obviously bleeding into the brain, which led to the, the, the most severe cases. Um, this is um, a rare among patients who are not treated with medications to stop the coagulation system. We, we, in medicine, we have many indications where we give our patients medications to stop the, 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 the coagulation uh, in patients who had uh, thrombosis or we want to prevent thrombosis. But in patients who are not treated with that, this is an, an unusual presentation. And when those patients um, were tested for their coagulation system, the blood just didn't coagulate at all. So it was very, very clear that, that they had be, been exposed to something that uh, caused a great derangement in the coagulation system. So what, what are the intended effects of, of nice guy, you know, psychoactively and physically, and, and what happens to long-term users? So there's actually no connection at all um, between the intended use. Um, Mr. Nice Guy is a synthetic cannab cannabinoid drug. So it's basically um, more medical marijuana or cannabis, but produced in a lab. And it's much more potent in its uh, um, pharmacological activity to bind to the receptors in the brain. So we have on the one side a synthetic lab produced um, drug, which should not cause any derangement in your coagulation system. And on the other hand, the observation that, that these patients are bleeding um, as if they were taking uh, anticoagulants. And what happened in the past when, when these things were tested, and this is what, what appears to be the case in, 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 in our cases here, in our outbreak, is that somehow, we don't know exactly how, um, anticoagulant um, act or uh, substances which act as anticoagulants have been um, um, mixed with the synthetically produced cannabis drugs. So these drugs are adulterated and we don't know how that happens. There are a lot of theories about that. Um, and, and actually in our outbreak, we also found the same kind of um, anticoagulant used basically as rat poison, um, which um, was found in those uh, synthetically produced cannabis drugs. So how, how addictive uh, is Mr. Nice Guy or is it what, what's in it that's addictive? And what precisely is the difference between nice guy and cannabis? So cannabis is the produce of a plant. It's uh, produced and it has been used for thousands of years in, the, in different human cultures. And it is a mix of very, very different, uh, many, many different uh, substances, actually. Uh, we think we know which are the most active ones. Um, Mr. Nice Guy or Nice Guy or many other um, uh, there are many other street names for those drugs. They are synthetically produced. They are chemically produced um, um, drugs that um, act on the same receptors. This is not one drug because every um, illicit lab produces a, a variation more or less. And, and these things are always developing over time. So nice guy is not like a pharmaceutically protected trade name where you know exactly what you will be consuming when you buy it. It's all illicit after all. Um, so it's basically a very, very, very strong um, enhanced effect of cannabis, what we, what we know is the cannabis effect. And because it's so much stronger, so the adverse effects of, of it are much stronger, not comparable to the simple med medical marijuana or uh, marijuana use um, by smoking, you know, wheat, what we call wheat. Now, the important thing is because this, this is all illicitly produced. Um, in our case, most cases, uh, in our, in our most, most of our cases, the Mr. Nice Guy was smoked. So what happens is that the synthetic drug is mixed in in leaves, in dried leaves, similarly to tobacco leaves. It's not tobacco, but it's all kinds of different leaves, and then smoked. And we think that by accident, there's no purpose in, uh, we don't think that there's any purpose in doing that. By accident, the rat poison that has the strong anticoagulant effect 
was mixed with the leaves and whoever was smoking the, the synthetic cannabinoid was exposed to that rat poison with dramatic and drastic effects. Wow, all right. Well, Professor Koenig, thank you so much for this informative yet unfortunately disturbing report. My pleasure. Now on to politics. Justice Minister Gideon Saar taking his biggest campaign promise to the Knesset floor. Saar pushing legislation that would set term limits of no more than eight years in total for the position of prime minister. Saar saying that ruling too long brings with it a concentration of power and the risk of corruption, and therefore it's right to conclude in the basic law, to include in the basic law, the principle of restriction. With us to respond, Israeli journalist, author, and attorney, Ben Dol Yamini. Ben Dol, thanks so much for being with us. Now, do you agree that Israel needs term limits, and why or why not? Yes, Israel needs uh, that kind of law. I mean, uh, it's uh, a law that exists in many, many democratic countries. We need it uh, in order to uh, to enable a kind of change, to enable uh, uh, that not one uh, person uh, will rule the country for so many years. Uh, eight years, it's enough uh, for any democratic country. We need it. What we do not need uh, is a personal law, which means uh, that because of political uh, uh, differences, uh, we will uh, initiate a law that will be actually directed to one person. That's what we do not need. Now, uh, I have to admit that uh, I was totally against the law when it was directed uh, uh, to one person, a personal law, speaking about, of course, uh, the ex-Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, but they changed it. They understood. I mean, it's not only me who published articles against this kind of personalization of uh, the law. Uh, I think after a lot of criticism, they changed it, so it's going to be from now on and not about the uh, people who are in, uh, in, uh, um, uh, in office right now, and it will not include even not Benjamin Netanyahu. Okay, so... Uh Again, though, I want to stay on, on that, actually, because that is a, a major concern for a lot of people. Even though Saar claims that the bill will not be retroactive, you know, supporters of the bill, of former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, I should say, say that this is meant to target his ability to run for office again in the future. Uh, this because Netanyahu already served for 15 years. Uh, and again, there was an original agreement from June in which coalition lawmakers said that they'd propose a version that would keep two-term prime ministers from running even for Knesset for a period of four years, which would definitely target Netanyahu. Do, do you think that any part of these legislations that are being promoted from the coalition have Netanyahu in mind? No, no. I mean, the, the, I mean, the, it's not the original law. That's what has been changed uh, because of uh, a lot of criticism. So it is not going to affect uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. It's not even going to affect uh, uh, Naftali Bennett and not uh, Yair Lapid. It's going to affect only the future prime ministers, not uh, people who are um, in office now. Now, so so. Uh, it's a big problem for those who uh, wanted a law that will be directed to Netanyahu. They wanted to affect Netanyahu. They wanted to uh, uh, bar him from any uh, uh, any return to uh, the to the uh, job of prime minister. They are going to be disappointed. All right, but so, but yeah. let me tell you. No, no, just just to, to, to understand. I mean, when Netanyahu himself or um, his people, his supporters, when they initiated a personal law that will enable him to overcome uh, uh, the uh, process against him in court, uh, it was, at least me, I was against it because uh, any personal law is not helping democracy. So, so again, so, there, so, there's there's kind of a fuzzy uh, uh, separate bill. Uh, Sal says that he's looking to push a separate bill from the term limits bill that would bar people from running for office while under criminal indictment. Uh, and this also does not exclusively target Bibi or or does it name Prime Minister or former Prime Minister Netanyahu? But but again, it it, it sounds to a lot of people, especially those who support Netanyahu, that it is intended to target him. Okay, let me tell you something about this law, about people who are indicted. And, and there was a big debate, a big debate, a real one, not a political one. Uh, in the Knesset in 2001, 
and um, uh, when they actually uh, enacted this law. And uh, it's very interesting because in that debate that took place in that time, it was people from all parties, from all parties, Arab parties, left-wing parties, uh, who said that we cannot, we cannot allow the uh, general attorney to determine who is going to be the prime minister only by indictment. So, and, and there is, it makes sense. It makes sense because in Israel- an indictment is not guilt. No. No, 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 no. The point is, the point is that what they claimed in that time, in that debate, without any, I mean, it, it, all political parties, what they claimed in that time is we cannot really, we cannot give up our authority and we cannot allow uh, uh, an official, someone like the Attorney General, that he will dictate for us who is going to be the Prime Minister. Ben Yamini, thank you so much for your, uh, for your insights. Thank you for having me. Moving on, a neglected eyesore, a dangerous nuisance, and one of the biggest sources of pollution in the state of Israel. These are just some of the charming adjectives used to describe the central bus station in South Tel Aviv, the second largest bus station in the world. And it's been this way practically since its opening nearly 30 years ago. But residents in the station's periphery won't have to suffer much longer, as the government has finally announced plans to shut it down. I'll tell you Rifkin with the details. Nearly 30 years since its official opening, and the massive maze-like central bus station in South Tel Aviv is set to be shut down. And Transportation Minister Meirav Michaeli announcing the news on Tuesday, making good on one of her many campaign promises. Michaeli saying that while, quote, it won't happen overnight, this eyesore, which is an environmental, health, and transportation hazard, will be cleared from here. Essentially, the outline is to reroute all lines away from the station by late 2023 and to completely dismantle the concrete ramp used by the buses by 2025. As for the building itself, within five to ten years after the station's closure, the enormous 230,000 square meter plot of land will be repurposed though it's unclear whether this means leveling the site or heavily renovating it. Architects warning that the building's concrete shell will be virtually impossible to knock down and would coat the city in dust for weeks if attempted. It's also not yet clear where the bus lines will be rerouted to or where a new bus station will be built, if at all. But in any case, the move being welcomed by residents nearby who've long been decrying the negative impacts of the station. And it's not just impacting residents' health. Located in the poorest part of the city, the station rife with crime, drug addicts, prostitution and sexual assaults, homeless squatters, and even murder. One abandoned section of the station has even been inhabited by a massive colony of bats. Despite breaking ground in December 1967, it wasn't until 1993 that the station was finally completed, and at the time of its opening, it was the largest station on Earth. But it was mirrored nearly from the get-go with financial difficulties and arguments between investors, bus companies, designers, business owners, and the government. So by the time the doors were opened, the city's bus center had already migrated north and the area fallen into poverty. And by January 2012, the station's owners had filed for its bankruptcy. Our final topic tonight, Israeli retailers worried and angry as international sporting goods behemoth Nike surprising them with a sudden massive shift in policy. In line with plans to adapt to the global marketplace, Nike is explaining that the continuation of the business relationship between Israeli sellers and Nike corporate no longer matches the company's policies and goals. Here with the details, head of the Technological Marketing Department at Sapir College, Assistant Professor Vili Abraham. Vili, it's great to have you back. Now, where did this come from? How, and how will it affect, more importantly, Israel's economy overall? Well, uh, back in 2017, uh, Nike has decided to adopt a strategy called direct-to-consumer. Um, and it wants to do it for two reasons. First of all, it wants to 
provide a premium experience to consumers and it wants to be controlled over that, to have control over that experience. And the other reason is because it wants to have control over prices um, or more correctly pricing. If you have different prices for the same shoe or, or same brand in different places, this might cause confusion among consumers and eventually might even impact uh, the brand image. So I guess this is something that it wants to do. And by the way, if you look at uh, the stock price of Nike ever since 2017, even a little bit before that, uh, the stock price has almost tripled. Um, and so has its uh, market valuation, which has increased significantly. Today, it's, it's a $30 billion company. All right, now you mentioned, you mentioned uh, that Nike wants to ideally control its pricing. But this will, uh, won't this undoubtedly lead to a gross inflation of the price on Nike products in Israel? And if the move is truly global, it may lead to a rise in costs to all consumers, no? Well, not necessarily. If it wants to control the pricing, it might set a, a particular price for different uh, shoe, shoe models. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. Regarding its effect on Israel, I don't think it will have a major effect, although the small retailers will not be able to sell Nike products, but they can sell uh, other brands, uh, not Adidas, which also is following suit, but there are other brands and other market segments that they can target. I think that it's, it's, it's always a good idea not to put all your eggs in one basket. What, what about Nike's yeah, bottom line in Israel? Will, will, will consumers well, maybe stop be... buying Nike? Well, it depends how you look at it. If you look at millennials, uh, and in general, uh, it has a 62% share of the market. It has a lot of loyal consumers. And I think if you increase the price by 10 or 20%, it may not deter them, although it depends on price sensitivity. But I think the people who buy Nike in Israel are the people who are from you know, the middle class and, and higher upper middle class. They, they can afford Nike because it's, it's more expensive than it is in Israel. So I don't think it will have a big... Uh, effect on its bottom line because the demand will be increased among the larger retailers, which will be selling Nike in Israel. So it means that there just will be a, a shift in demand from the smaller retailers to the more larger, bigger retailers. All right. And my final question that I know you mentioned that this was a plan that was put forward already in 2017 and Nike already similarly cut its ties to Amazon in 2019. Uh, but there are critics who claim that perhaps Nike is jumping on this BDS bandwagon. Do you think that there's any truth to that claim? And, and if there is, do you think Nike will ever come out and say it? No, they'll never say it. Uh, because if you if we, remember, we spoke about Ben and & Jerry, and they have suffered uh, the dire consequences of its move. The investment uh, moves on the side of many uh, uh, states in the United States. Uh, I, look, you know, Nike is a public company, and all it wants to do is increase its profits. The higher its profits, the greater value a brand has, and it brings profits to investors. And I think it's strictly a um, business move. Um, today, With because of coronavirus, a lot of people moved online. They buy online, and they want to be in control. They want to sell directly to consumers, because if you don't have any intermediaries, it means that there is nobody take, to take a bite, or, uh, a bite out of your profits, and you make more money. And I think it's just strictly a move to increase its profits. All right. Billy Abraham, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Now let's take a look at the weather forecast with Hannah Rifkin. We're looking at sunny days ahead no matter where you live in Israel, with lows ranging tonight in the mid to upper teens, and tomorrow's highs expecting to range in the upper 20s and lower 30s. Now back to the studio with Aaron. And now before we go, of course, let's take a look at what's going viral here in Israel. <coughs> there we got a dash cam, police officer. Oh, that was smart. Yeah, don't drive on the shoulder, people. It's dangerous and it's dumb. Good done. Good done. Instant karma. All right, that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.25 shekels to the American dollar and 2.57 shekels to the Canadian dollar. And finally, for the latest updates and news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as to our newsletter at ILTV.tv. I'm Aaron Forrest. Be well. Thank you so much for watching.